Hey, my pleasure to. Um, is this where's Chris? Oh, you're there. I'm Claire McDonald, and it's my pleasure to introduce you to the last ideas of the parakeets of the season. Um, for those people who haven't been before, Ideas and Aperitifs is an informal uh, dialogue, a kind of seminar really, conversational environment where people from UAL doing current research, artists doing practice-based research can talk about projects. Um, we like to run it here because this is a very convivial atmosphere and we'll be working next year between October and December with something I think we're going to call Ideas and Aperitifs Doubles with pairs of people. And what we've done this year is that we've had um, a lot of people who've given talks about various aspects of their work. We have had very few painters, but I think the only other painter we've had was Rebecca Fortnum. Um, I am really pleased to be able to welcome Mick Finch to Ideas and Parities. And I have uh, double agents to thank for my introduction to Mick Finch. I've been in the university for about 20 months. And I came across Mick's work when he gave a presentation at Crosscurrent, which is um, the uh, seminar that double agents run to give artists at CSM a chance to talk about their work to each other. And I was really blown away by Mick's work. A lot of my own interests are in the relationship between writing, art writing and performance. And I love the way that Mick's work operates both discursively and visually with ideas about mark making, about painting, about the way that the painting and the mark come off the page. And out of that experience, we began to have a dialogue and began to talk about doing a book together. In the meantime, uh, ICFA has set up its own imprint, and actually I'm incredibly proud that like, this is taking us off the subject of Mick for a bit, but we have our first book, which has just come from the printers today, with a painter called Paula Kane, who works at Byam Shaw, and her project studio Wall, which we're launching next week at the October Gallery on the 26th. And you, it's being distributed by Corner House, as will be Nick's book. Um, and you can find out about it on our website. You can ask myself and Chris about that later on. So today, what I really wanted Mick to do is to just talk about his work. The way I see his work, which may not be quite how Mick sees the work, is really as a dialogue between two very clear aspects of Mick's practice. One of which is actually profoundly discursive to do with the way in which his work appears in and realises itself through language. And the other one is really thinking about the limits, the boundaries and the possibilities of the mark as I see it, and the image. Um, and I think everything else I can leave to Mick himself to discursively extrapolate. Um, and I'm just going to switch off the light now. Um, and then we'll have time for questions at the end. Um, right. Well, I'm going to... Um, it's going to be a bit strictly boring the way I'm going to do this. I'm, I don't see any other way than in a way, given a, a background that actually goes way back. Um, um, but I'm going to skip through a lot of things, but I think it's very important just to have a sense of um, uh, what I've been up to, I'd say, since about, profoundly since 95. And um, it's really, as much as what Claire's saying, which is, is accurate, there's a relationship between... Um, I don't know what you call it, it's discursive territory and uh, practice. Um, that discursive territory is to do with the fact I've written uh, oh, since about 95. Um, but also I put into the pot that it's about teaching. I, I still do mm -hmm. see teaching, writing and practice as really co-joined. I'll go through this particular moments that actually teaching has really transformed and provided forks in the road for me at times. Um, the, there's one paradigm which really exists in the work which is to do with uh, the fact that before I was working at CSM I was living in France for uh, I don't know, about 17 years, I was teaching there for about nine years. And there's a sort of cultural aspect, certainly to things which one, I think bluntly one would call formalist ideas, and uh, what would, in a very schematic sense, would be a 
two cultural formations of those, which I've, I've, had, my, I've had various contacts with, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about those as I go. So what I'm going to do is show, show the work, but also show some key contextual aspects, um, and, and also sort of talk about how I arrived at that. I mean, what I, what I want to do, first of all, is just go way, way back, in the sense that... Um, one thing that really I had to, I think, identify quite early on was that the way I was taught formed formed a particular vision of what I understood about certain things. And one of these was about notions of abstraction, which the sort of education I had <coughs> at uh, an art school in Ravensbourne and then Royal College, very much in the, in the background of the 80s, which was to do with sorts of senses of lyricism and lyricism being related to a type of abstraction which inevitably in an English context get linked to landscape and um, just to give you some background to that um, that's what I was doing last year and I'm quite embarrassed to show these now but I'm going to do it anyway <laughs> um, that it just to show in a sense what I had to work I was working out from in a way and uh, I was at Royal College about 85, and I was really working within a context of um, certainly that, I think for many painters who were around at the time, that appalling aspect of the new spirit of painting and sort of coming out of a sort of domination of, um, put it bluntly, Greenbergian formalism. Um, what I found myself doing instinctively, I haven't gone any back further back than the Royal College, was I, I tried to make paintings which were, um, in a sense, coming out of a certainly a European background, relationship to certainly artists like Braque and Matisse, which I think was quite current at the time. Um, but the, um, the aspect that I think I was trying to identify there was a, a relationship between um, abstraction uh, signification, image, but totally, I don't think it's, it's so naive looking back at it, but it, it what was um, characterised was two things, I think, one was a kind of visual complexity and the other was a, a resistance to reductive forces, I think the only way I could put it. Um, and this, this was done, I think, completely intuitively and if I say to you, for example, at the Royal College I was there 82 to 85. Um, um, some, somebody like Michael Fried, who's you know, a completely standard theoretical component of a um, uh, discourse of painting, was completely absent as somebody would know about, would be talked about. And it took me a lot longer to get to sort of basic knowledge of like, even how sort of certain formations of uh, UK American painting was working, um, but the thing I'm sort of rushing through these ones. But what um, happened between here is that these are paintings that are called Sodium Nights, so they're a kind of distillation of literally a very empirical, impressionistic um, idea of picture making. Really, um, then I went to <coughs> France and. I started making paintings where there were lots of pretexts to what I was doing. Pretext in these ones of then 17 uh, was using, by the way, sorry, the projector is incredibly grey, incredibly dull. They are a little bit more colourful than this. They're quite a lot more colourful. Um, one of the things I tried to do um, I think because I was, um, it was the first time I'd lived abroad and or lived outside of a very familiar context. Uh, I was living in a small town just north of Paris. I was driving in a lot to Paris and uh, I was driving on this road called the N17. And, um, and what struck me, because most of the between songs, which is a very picturesque French mainly 18th century town and then into the suburbs of Paris, 
was driving through this um, landscape which was very flat. Uh, there was um, Charles de Gaulle uh, Airport and it's kind of hinterland. And the thing that interested me was the impression that kept building up through successive, since repetitive journeys. And um, what I did was made paintings which uh, tried to tap into that. Well, I don't think they were terribly successful at all. But what I started to do was um, use something called the calcomania paper, which is a silkscreen paper. And it's a, it's a water-soluble gum coated paper. And I was painting onto the paper with oil paint, putting it in a vat of water. The gum would release and it was backed onto the canvas. And so it was, in a sense, using a transcriptive uh, process to build up these, these paintings. And what was happening was that I was starting to build them in terms of like the thickness, the notion of the thickness of the, of the painting. Um, and what that started to do was, in a way, question um, the terms, certainly by which I'd I'd understood um, uh, so the ideas like flatness, especially through um, uh, looking at, say, people like Matisse, and an earlier American painting, for example, and actually from a BA education, being really very, um, very in contact with. Um, um, subjected to Greenberg's ideas that were very dominant in the 70s. And what increasingly um, I came to be interested in was this, this sense of how the surface would build up. And actually how this, this sense of thickness could, um, could be very... Uh, we just let this person in. Yeah, sure. Hi. And those paintings I just showed you were um, shown in threes. They were on square and they, um, they tended to work in threes. And what I, I, I started to be interested more was in the sense that the way one would dissemble the, the other, how they would work in, in a kind of um, uh, conversation. <coughs> and at that point, I sort of started to sort of shed that protectional aspect of wanting to access an experience uh, like a, a, a road journey. And I really just got more interested in the structure and of uh, the paintings in very specific terms. And for a brief moment, I made these sort of box-like structures. This is about 95, um, which were working into repetition. They were like postcard size, small ones. So this idea of reproduction and, and possibly a, an original. Um, I, made, I made a number of those, but they quickly um, transformed into these paintings, which became called Tri-Square. And at this point, I, I really started to work into very um, definitive series, which really would focus on um, particular mechanisms of painting. And particular, I, I think later I would call them, um, I think, rhetorical aspects of painting. And the background to these ones was, was in a way, using some of the, I suppose, all over or um, not quite monochrome strategies, but strategies of um, painting which um, one would associate with a very reductive um, idea of painting. And I put them together. These are on, these are, I can't remember exactly how big these are, but they're, I think they're the one meter 20 by 40, so they're three squares basically. 
<coughs> and uh, I actually never showed these until very, very recently. These were test bed works, uh, just trying to, in a sense, generate. Um, God, that's so bright. Trying to generate, um, uh, I think I'd use the word st strategy, and also to to negotiate or interrogate very particular ideas, and um, also in a way it was, it was to do with that context, of the the eighties, uh, in terms of, sort of similar simulationist painting pictures, etc. That sort of area from the the nineties, whereby. Uh, the abstraction as representation um, was really the key question. I, I became very interested in that. Um, what happened then, as I started to make a series called Close to New Things, it's 96 to 98, and um, the first part of that was in a way trying to bring these three separated in a way one plus one plus one equals you know, another product into one one painting um, again using the decalcomania uh, paper uh, ways of set building up surfaces um, um, in a way it's kind of play between surfaces and also Using grids, um, I don't know how evident it is, but a painting like that, um, the uh, grids that are laid down are—it's it's quite a complex play between um, uh, horizontal and vertical processes. Um, and a painting like that starts to introduce. Uh, a quite informal aspect, um, whereby the, uh, the paint in the middle would move the canvas and the paint would, would uh, drip through a gridded field. And it felt like a scan in a way, it would sort of read the surface, and, you know, highly built up, encrusted surfaces, then in a sense having a more informal element which, um, which would um, um, literally read across it. I'd, I'd used, I, I was thinking of the sense of, of, of elements literally bringing something into play um, in a transcriptive sense. Now, what happened then was I went um, to um, London from, um, from Paris and I saw this advert, it's called The Magic is Closer Than You Think. It was a, it's an advert for Disneyland. And um, I was very struck by something about the image, in the sense that um, it's an incredibly simple image, which um, it's a tunnel, it's Mickey, what's first of all, it's Mickey Mouse. It's also a tunnel, um, because it's at the end of the tunnel. The other side says, guess what's waiting on the other end of the tunnel. But it, um, it's just struck me how fast um, one went to identify what the image was and it, it made me, it, it set me off on a trail of thought in terms of thinking of um, how um, in a sense gestalt properties were working in communication models and how in a sense um, um, an aspect of minimalism which in a way uh, modified or not modified actually created a discourse around painting particularly with judd and i'll go back i'll go into this more more in more detail in a second um how gestalt qualities had but it says dominated one way of making mainly that minimalist conceptualist um reductive idea which has all sorts of um powerful and useful uh, ends but it also suppressed this the sense of the com complexity of, um, of of an image. So what I did was I started to. Uh, this is the first one I did very um, ruggedly use elements of this Mickey Mouse motif and just embed them 
uh, make them disappear into um, s mechanisms, tropes of painting, which are um, the paraphernalia of um, uh, all over gridded works. For example, in there, there's some, um, it's more evident here, it's a very highly um, complex grid that's uh, um, masked up, which um, in it there's a barely visible shape, and the shape is kind of just there as a as a as a presence. You're not quite sure what it is. It, it is this this the shape of uh, the big mouse head again, and um, the sense of how that advert was working in terms of the magic is closer than you think. That something's happening on an automatic level. It's happening uh, without you even thinking. That there's a sign, it's almost insidious presence at work. Um, this sort of sense of an underneath or something below the surface. I wanted to introduce them into these, uh, into a, a regime of painting which um, um, doesn't usually, I suppose, host that type of um, that type of presence. Again, this this was using some of those strategies I, I talked about earlier on. There, surfaces built up. There's aspects of this image at work. You can see it probably more profoundly on the left. Um, paint is loaded up onto the canvas and dripped through and revealing. It's white on white and the black is dripping or being pulled um, from left to right. And that's a type of scan revealing these, uh, these networks. In the painting like this, um, it's barely visible there. It's just about visible there. The, the ground was a, a, a white ground, uh, regrounded with a very thick uh, white paint, and then using um, the top of a Mickey Mouse um, sweet box in, uh, encrusted into the surface, just making the shape, printed into the surface. And again, the paint would be. Um, uh, reading across from left to right, revealing, in a sense, this this invisible aspect, or this hardly visible aspect. And that's the um, that's the source of that image. But to go back into the to go into the um, the background of that, um, the sense. Increasingly for me, and this is something I, I, I can't, I don't know how much detail I'm going to, but it, with, with the, the moment of minimalism and the relationship to painting, and certainly in a context um, between Europe and America, uh, at this moment, um, this is when I started to get interested in theory. Um, I was teaching at Parsons at that point. I, start, I started writing them as well for a contemporary magazine, just by accident actually. And it intensified as more I came to um, certainly think about minimalism in the light of Michael Fried's Beholder Discourse, the art and object discourse. And, and actually realising this piece by Morris is actually a completely critical piece in relationship to Greenberg's idea that um, if you put a piece of uh, canvas you just tacked it up on the wall, it would be a painting, but not necessarily a great painting. But by, by slitting it like so, and it dropping to the floor, so there'd be a relationship between the thing as a, um, as a flat surface, and as a shape, and as a three-dimensional object, that he was, in a way, opening up, certainly opening up Greenberg to other discussions, but he's, um, it's a directly critical piece. Um, the other aspect of, of, of Morris, which I was less sympathetic to, was the gestalt aspect, that um, uh, the, the idea of simple form, primary ABC form, for example, and the sense it came much more through Judd that um, European painting and sculpture, especially painting, was compositional, was internal, and it needed uh, the viewer to, in a sense, dissemble it, 
whereas what, again Judd would identify as an American sensibility where you wouldn't <coughs> have to look into it it would dissemble itself it would um, it would in a sense extend out automatically these are key discourses uh, of, of the minimalist period which uh, have a huge impact on how paintings being understood mainly in American I'd say well, obviously in this country UK American access access and the thing the question I kept asking especially with this advert was that actually this the power of this ad image is totally in terms of gestalt effect that you go from the part to the whole automatically you, you, you really don't have to think about it and that what's obviously the power of the image also is quite terrifying of its, of its um, um, efficiency as, a, as an object um, and it might, made me ask questions about well is there a difference between an artistic model and a communication model it's something I still play with the other the other thing that um, yeah, was increasingly important at that time Yves Alambois was being read a lot, painting his model um, but he wrote an essay um, called A Picturesque Stroll Around Clara Clara which was about Smithson and Sarah where he actually um, uh, talks about the difference between a gestalt image of something uh, holding something in one's head and an experience of it and I'll come back to Clara Clara and oh no, I don't know, I don't know. well basically with Clara Clara what he was saying the power of that piece was that mm -hmm. as you walked around it it changed it shifted you it would shift in terms of your expectation of what it is as a, as a totality and that he attributed this to a, a sort of parallax effect that uh, your relationship changes with the object in terms of your position to it, um, which is something you could easily attribute to a sort of way a, a cubist painting maybe works. But um, these aspects of um, um, the whole to the part were very important at that, that point in trying to think through various aspects of painting. I'll come back to that in a second. Um, Rush through a bit here, but this close the closer you think uh, series, which, which I showed about three, four times. I, I then extended into really picking up on this difference between a kind of European and American uh, point of view. For example, here I'm using that strategy where I'm laying the, the shape into the, the the interior part of this uh, image, and the exterior is camouflage. It's American trellis camouflage from the 60s. And there's a play between visibility and invisibility, and also um, senses of presence. Again, this insidious aspect was was interesting to me. But also, a, a sort of hegemonic relationship to the image at that point, and how, in a way, process isn't just innocent. It's not just phenomenological. <coughs> about quite um, how would you call them? Sort of um, very primal ideas of presence that maybe. Presence can be something that you can talk of, think of in other terms. Um, so the paintings then start to move into other areas, which are really broadly, I'd say, they're touching into rhetorical and later very specific aesthetic uh, concerns. So I'm going to rush through these a bit. I don't want to linger uh, too much. But for example, the, the, the sense that the camouflage is highly visible at this point, um, and yet it's a trope of, of, of invisibility. And then what's going on in the interior of this painting, I'm not sure I'm going to be very clear, but it's got embedded in here these, uh, these, uh, these shapes of uh, the Mickey Mouse head. Um, it was playing, playing into a very, very pres prescribed area. And actually from this point on as well, I, I started to get involved with transcribing, permutating the image using, at this point as well, I'm starting to use projectors. I'm starting to use, um, actually at this point there were cut stencils. Um, I'm using more and more um, strategies, I think distancing strategies were in the studio 
um, similar way to using decalcomania paper in one sense, but um, ways of also just projecting one thing from one place to another, by an image of sorts. But all the time from here on, there's a kind of use of um, um, highly schematic uh, shape, which is on the edge of being something else, which is what Benjamin Boutlet calls um, factura, the sense of like the point which something turns towards signification. Well, he doesn't call it factura, it, it, it was a term that was used in Russia in the constructivist period. This, these paintings went on for about two years. Um, what then became very important, I made a series of as it says their playground, was um, this sense of having a multiplic multiplicity of things in one, one place, in a way, um, which was going on from the tri-square paintings. Um, I got very, I think, overly interested in making these very um, intricate networks, almost like net, um, knots, knotted networks, um, whereby they'd be masked out very intricately. For example, in this one, as you can see, there's a dripped aspect with the vertical drips, which is webbed into a sort of um, Mickey Mouse repeated uh, motif. Um, what happened in that was that I s the actual masking up became more, more interesting. What I noticed was that I was using very low-grade um, masking tape. And it leaked. I'll show you this a bit later, but the transcriptive moment, the sense that where the leak would happen. So, what, for example, um, in its, well, I'll show you with the, with some pages to come up in a second. Um, yeah, I'll get back to that. But before that, the thing that um, um, really came to light at this point was a. Um, I think the only way to describe it is a kind of paradigm, in a way. Um, again, Bois, Yvonne and Bois expresses it in the introduction to painting's model. He talks about the two formalisms. He talks about one being, in the sense of European, he's, he's really related into constructivism, he's very interested in signification, so it's production of value. Uh, and the other being American, in, in that sense, open to being used, instrumentalized, however you want to describe it. The other being a, an American formalism, which um, is more in terms of autonomy and in terms of very different ideas of specificity. And what I became increasingly um, interested in was this expanded field, which was really being the expanded field in painting, which I don't know if you're all aware of that, Sort of use of Rosalind Krauss's term of the expanding field in sculpture and the way of describing the move from, from minimalism to conceptual art through, well, first of all, through, um, uh, through land art into uh, ideas of category. Um, so the limit, in the sense of extending from the work into the space, uh, into an institution, into the world, etc. This idea that was applied to painting, I'd say from the 90s on, here with Polly Applebaum, uh, Stockholm is the one everyone always talks about, she always gets pulled up in that context. Uh, James Hyde, um, I think more interestingly. Um, but in France there was an equivalent, Philip Richard, he's, um, um, he's about 50, <coughs> Edouard Poulier, and Miguel Mont. Um, but what I suddenly become, became aware of was another, another example of it, and actually really very specifically French, and uh, actually bearing out from the writings of Hubert Danish, very particularly, um, especially a book called uh, Fenêtre Jaune Cadmium, which is um, a book from the 50s, which has never, it's not so far been translated, where he's talking about the thickness of perception. He's talking about specificity of painting in terms of the thickness and the, the volumetric aspect of painting. Uh, one can be expressed in terms of, in a way, um, manipulating the support in different ways. In Hontai, 
He's, he's died recently. Um, this, I, I, I couldn't find a contextual slide. This is a very large painting. Um, it's a grid. What he would do is, with the unstretched canvas, he folds um, uh, what are the white parts in and knots them at each corner. So he's folding, it's very hard to explain, but he folds um, along these tramways, along the gridway, and then knots them, and then paints it all blue. So he's got one point of blue monochrome. And then he breaks it apart, he breaks the knots, and then it reveals um, uh, this grid. So it's a, a, a sort of making that goes from manipulation of the three dimensional surface to, um, to the 2D surface. This, this is another one. These ones are the one on the right would be um, uh, wrapped up in like a ball. And then he'd paint that, so you'd have to have a blue ball, and then unpick it and then stretch it up. So there's a relationship between the, in a sense, the, the, the expanded aspect, the, the, the relationship to volume was, was through uh, manipulation. So the, the, the relationship to the image I found very different. Holtz uh, just died. He, he, um, he was very active from the 50s on. And uh, Georges de Eudemann's written a lot, of, a lot on him. Um, some very good things. And, and the other aspects which were increasingly becoming um, clear to me were supported so fast. This is Daniel Deserve. Um, where this aspect of the, the grid again is, is volumetrically um, expressed in a way which I mean, was, I'd, I'd express it myself as not just about the colonization of painting, um, colonization of space by painting. It's actually um, it's, it's, it's looking into the mechanism of painting in this range, of the sense of like the, the grid unrolling, um, bringing in, into play all sorts of references. Uh, another one's Patrick Say. Actually, it's not Say. I, I remember saying it's, 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 it's a class called Billier. Billier, uh, I think it's Billier. B I O U L E S. But it's um, it's this tressage process um, of, in a way, yeah, look into uh, aspects of work which. Uh, aspects of painting which are um, at a very, um, I'd say, an infra-thin level of the painting. They're, they're, they're quite subtle. Francois Rouen is another. He literally cuts up, say, two canvases and then weaves them together. Um, Lacan wrote a very famous essay about these, in the sense that when you're looking at it, you're only seeing half materially what's there. Um, and this, this aspect of, of something much more um, about, in a sense, a, a, a volume, but also about image, about um, thickness, if you like, thickness of perception, in a sense, started to interest me much more. And I found myself actually being quite antagonistic, feeling quite antagonistic, or critical, toward this other, I, th I thought, rather gratuitous, expansive idea of painting. Uh, which uh, was very prevalent at the time. This is Christian Bonfoy, uh, who was part of Group Rougeau Part. Bonfoy worked with Ivan Ambois. They were both students of, of Hubert Damisch. Um, and he works on both sides of a canvas. Uh, he works on something called Talata. So this, again, this sense of the, the, ex the, the extension is, is, is very, I find, very subtly played. It's, it's very, I think, subtly understood by a lot, a lot of these artists. Um, and also they, they position themselves very, very carefully, very particularly. This is Dominic Figarella, uh, who's an um, artist in his 40s, I think, um, who, um, for example, here is a, makes a puddle, photographs the puddle. Uh, he then makes a photographic image of it, cuts it out, and lays it into the painting. There's a sense of, um, it's a bit like um, a box with the sound of its own making in one sense. But there's, a, there's, a, there's a relationship between you know, another state, its reflection, the mirror aspects in a sense, and uh, position, verticality, horizontality, things like that. 
and I find I was finding these things increasingly interesting. Um, I'm going to rush through these. All I, all I would say about these ones is I became very interested in monochrome and was using um, just purely uh, this vestigial aspect of the leak of paint. Um, I, I, I'd mask up this, this, this network. The first um, coat would be white, it would leak, and the second coat would be the same as ground. Um, and this accident, in a sense, started to inform all the work I made, I'd say till quite recently in a way. Um, but I then made a series of three-dimensional three works, which um, they certainly were using this idea of parallax in the sense that they were like exploded paintings um, going in actually in four directions. They're quite hard to describe, I and mean, the only way I can really do is flip through them. Um, but as you go round it, the back would be a grid. You go round the side, would be another grid, half um, um, interspersed with this Mickey image, and coming round into the full sort of Mickey motif there. Oops. Sorry. And then into one which is interspersed between camouflage and, and grid. And the thing that interests me with this was you could only you could only really understand it by moving around it. And it started to the, the, the sort of questioning that it, it would provoke interested me. Um, it was called repost because it was this idea of an answer to some of these other questions of, of, of extension expansion, which I was thinking of. This was another one from the same show, showed these ones in Paris, um, which was using um, the sense of the thing unfolding. Again, that so only some of it is visible, that you, you have a sense that there's a, a thickness of something at work. Um, There was another series called Sublimey, which, in a way, I was using heads again. Um, I don't know how much detail I should go into, because I think we'll get to the later ones, but the, the thing that was at work here was, in a sense, um, using actually 18th, 18th century ideas of sublime, but also heads again, this time the Queen's head, um, but also vanitas heads, skulls, but also using a kind of sequential idea of laying the, the image down, using the, the dripping, the um, entrelac of the painting to, in a sense, inscribe the image in. Um, and one like that uses a rotation of, the, of a skull. Um, it's, it's, there's a movement that goes on that you can detect. You can actually, you're, you're, you, can, you can unload it by looking at it. But the other thing that was going on here, increasingly, I was um, I was using images which I was um, modified in Photoshop, getting off the internet much of the time, but um, using um, projectors. At this point, actually, very low-grade projectors uh, to transcribe. I actually wrote an essay about this point called Night Shift which was about the sense of the increasing fact that painter studios are black. Um, it's like they're looking at projected images all the time. This, this again seemed to me interesting. This, this space of the projection seemed to me to be very important. That again, it's a kind of notion of the expansion. Um, so, you know, the, the, this accident, the vestige, if you, if you like, of the, of the mask, is absolutely what these works were made of. They were um, uh, like a very graphic element which I started to use. But increasingly what happened with these, but these, these are quite large paintings by the way, these are about, not large by my standards anyway, about six, um, 
just over two metres high. But with these sorts of paintings, what started to happen was the, the interest actually turned to this kind of taxon taxonomy, <coughs> which um, it introduced. Um, the grid in, in a way which has been present with closer than you think. Um, the use of the grid as a trope, I suppose for a, an idea of abstraction, which you know, one could read through in various ways. Here, um, what interested me was the flatness and um, the depth of the painting started to operate in different ways and actually started to bring up ideas of archive and um, uh, displacement of the image in various ways. I mean, it started to produce different readings. Um, and I played with this in various ways. Um, I mean, for example, in here there's a Fender guitar and there's a very complex camouflage drip system at the top. Um, encrusted with a with a um, uh, a skull, and this sort of uh, way of combining images um, starts to be what the work was about. And I found myself this was a, this was a series called Nevermind, where um, it just got pulled into colour. The drips were not always there, it was actually about combinations, a kind of engrammatic impression, almost I'd say composition, which interested me. Um, and also the sense of how shape could float between being a, a very primary element or something which is very literally what it is. Um, these are quite big as well, about two metres high. But this, this sort of sense of like producing a thickness um, of the painting in these terms um, was done alongside making paintings like uh, this one, which were very much in the flat space in the sense that um, yeah, the, the naturally gridded space whereby other readings could be produced. And this, this flatness depth model is what has actually driven the work in, from about, I don't know, 2003 on. And, and also it's taken me into the sense that um, I'm printing these out onto because to project them up, I'm using overhead projectors. So I'm going to Photoshop um, um, a painting like that one, for example. I can literally produce them as prints. They're masked out in a particular way. So there's a kind of transcriptive aspect which was fascinating me in a sense. I mean, this one's uh, directly printed out from the internet. It's the, um, I, I can't, I, I'm really bad because I get told off by people. I can't remember if it's um, if it's the Star Trek fleet or it's the Star Wars fleet. I should know really. <laughs> and I make terrible mistakes. I think they're Klingon, so I think it's Star Trek. And and I, I was, I'm a, able with some of these. This one, for example, I've made that painting about six times now, different sizes, and ex exhibited it in different ways. It's just a collection, literally a collection of skulls, um, which um, and that's what it looks like by the way size terms. Um, and this started to turn the work into something completely, completely different. So I'm rushing through. And this painting here is a, it, um, it's a painting I showed actually in London, is a, is a complete description of that in the sense that there's a, there's a repertoire of, um, of shapes um, and they're permutated and arranged, literally composed, <coughs> what I would use is, is composed in different ways and um, instead of producing being very productive in, in, in different ways. Now what was going on there was, um, and this was actually from teaching actually in France, I was teaching with a um, Italian woman called Fulvia Carnaval, who philosopher. She now is a half of a team called Clairefontaine, 
who um, and she's she's a philosopher who's worked with a lot with Rancière and Agamben, and um, and also Walter Benjamin, and the discussions we had brought me to sort of think about these types of models, these schematic models. The one on the left is the uh, that kind of Kleinian schema that um, Krauss used in um, the expanded field in sculpture. And on the right is one that uh, actually Susan Buck Morse used in a book called The Dialectics of Seeing about uh, Walter Benjamin's passage for them. And the sense here of like um, relationship, material relationship to the image, um, started in a sense uh, just chime in terms of ways sort of certain things were happening in the work. And it's, it's, it's led me into uh, a very particular set of references. I mean, first of all, with Benjamin, and then, of course, Warburg. Um, there was um, Warburg's reception in France was very particular, mainly because of a book by Georges de Huberman. Uh, well, it's an introduction by Georges de Huberman, a book by a guy called Alain Philippe Michaud, about Warburg, um, Warburg's relationship to the Pathos Formel and these things called planche where he was tracking, in the sense, the transmission, the movement of an image, um, basically from um, pre-Renaissance into Renaissance. And this is something he did right at the end of his life. Um, he showed at the end of his life, and also with a planche like that would be tracking how images would move uh, in terms of advertising in relationship to much older forms. So he's looking at things like the relationship of, of gesture, um, etc., things like that. Um, but this sort of sense, like organising things in these ways, um, started to interest me. And of course, the other one is you know, Richter's Atlas, the sense of how um, organisation of material, um, the relationships between things, which have been at work in some of the earlier paintings I was doing in a much less profound sense. Um, but I was finding myself using the computer, the archive of the computer, to, to generate things progressively. And what I found myself doing, for example, with that sequence called Nevermind, um, I was doing this just for my own um, uh, ends, really. I haven't never particularly shown it, but it's a sort of parallel practice thing that interests me, like between the Elvis Presley and the London Calling of the Clash. And never mind of uh, the Sex Pistols, to just that other use of the graphic, to Nirvana, never mind. And then the last ones when I, I just plugged in. Was, I mean, it's, a, it's it's silly. It's not particularly that interesting, but it's a sort of pathos formel, sense of a uh, a progression um, or a transformation. Um, and what I um, did quite recently was just in a sense unload all of the, the planche I'd made, the, um, the, the overhead projector um, transparencies um, and turn it into a show. I just projected them up and painted them. Um, um, I'm just going to show you also at the same time this sense I mean, to talk about the archive and relationship to that. I mean, I, the use of the website, you can see, I mean, with a PowerPoint, it's very particular how one describes how things are progressing. For example, these, I call them planche. These were paintings, as you can see, they're 116 by 73 centimetres. This is one progression, um, using different collections, different dynamics between images. That's actually a, a stole from Solar Whip completely. Um, in terms of permutation of a, of a, of a um, cube. Um, it's this famous piece, actually, King Krauss used in an essay, um, which actually seemed to be very pertinent in terms of, like, say, certainly how, uh, to how that works, for example. It just, it just seemed very opposite. Um, but, but at the same time I was making these, these paintings, I was also making... Um, these things are called dispositive, which um, 
Uh, for example, that one there. I'm sorry, the, the, the reproduction is absolutely appalling. But this one here has really transformed the practice recently. These are happening at the same time. I tend to have a very fragmented practice where I'm making things in parallel. Now I'm working between London and France. I've got two studios. I tend to make different things in different studios. And this website actually describes much more accurately the practice today and like the types of progressions and the, the switches and the jumps that are being made. And actually how it doesn't often make sense, you know. Um, and whereas a PowerPoint is quite hard to relay that. Also quite hard to get back into. Um, so I mean, yeah, this is how these paintings are made. The, this, 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 this leak of the um, um, masking tape is 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 present in all of them. Sometimes barely visible, but this sort of sense of a transcriptive moment is seemed to me very important to maintain. And at um, the same time I did, this, I did a show in Paris at a gallery called Christian Aubert of these uh, planches. I did a, in the sense they're coming off the internet quite often. Um, um, I then made a, an internet based book which was, I mean this is the PDF of it, it's a, it's a if you know what a Lulu is, it's a Lulu. It's made in design. Oh, bloody hell. And it, um, um, and it basically returns the images to, because at one point they are Photoshop files. And in a sense, it just returns them to another state. This sort of sense of how they're passing through different states, these works, was, seemed to me to be very important in the way. And actually, that it is an internet published book was very, very important. And there was a project which I'll talk about later, which has been postponed for the moment, um, which I'll show. Anyway, um, which relates to that. Then the, we're in the last phase, sorry. If you can, Almost there. The, the work I'm doing now, a lot of it doesn't quite add up because I'm, I'm working on. Um, I mean, I'm not sure quite where it's going myself, so I'm actually opening it up to scrutiny in a way. But I'm making now these reliefs where I'm incorporating um, some of these planches into. Um, yeah, they're like these ones, these are the earliest ones. Um, shapes are cut out, there's this roll motif which you saw in the sort of sense of a, a, you know, a roll of canvas, if you like, coming through, um, which was present in, say, the repost works. There's a sort of con conjunction of lots of different strategies coming into singular works now. And I'm not quite sure really where they're going. I'm actually using there's none here. I'm now using laser cutters to cut these shapes, and some of them have got three layers. And they, and ones like this, are using a, a print form in the background. Um, also revisiting some older motifs. This one's got a print form in the background, and I'll show you what the print form is in a second. Sorry, the slides are very burnt out. This is a very ultramarine blue. Um, this this is one that what doesn't make sense. I'm using some. Well, it does make sense. I think it's where there's another work to come. I've, I've got a whole set of fake Warhol Marilyns, which um, a silkscreen artist in Belgium I used to work with made, and they're absolutely amazing. And I'm now embedding those into works and using those. Alongside that, there's this set of prints being made. And this is a, is a result of working at CSM, and actually having to really try and understand the print areas more, um, more carefully. Um, they're A2 prints. But they're using these constellations, these, these repertoires of forms, um, on a very small level. Like, so here, um, I, I, I 
Shame I didn't bring any. This is, these are absolutely tiny, they look like pin bricks. But when you approach them, get up close, they, they are distinct. They have um, distinct character, identities, etc. And this sort of shift this, against this depth aspect of the interrogation of the image, the near farm, has been transformed now in, in terms of sort of reprographic repro aspect. These are not. And the Queen's Head, I didn't really go into it, but the Queen's Head I'm using not because I'm a royalist, but I was quite interested in a, in a, a rather tyrannical panoptic shape. Also something that expresses, I mean, rather crudely, ideas of sort of sovereignty and a, and a sort of you know, something that's inside and outside, a sort of state of exception in a sense. So I, 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 I keep returning to this... Monas um, the monastic, monastic no, the, monarch, the, the monarch's head in a way, uh, keeps coming back into the work. It's another print there. So I'm working on these. These are these are all printed off of um, uh, Epsom plotters onto actually etching paper. And the thing about Epsom plotters, which I never realised before, is they have two black reservoirs. So the blacks are incredibly intense and also the resolutions you can work with are extraordinarily fine and they're exploiting that. And there's another level that I'm working on in parallel to that, um, there's about three or four works. This, this, this is appropriations of the earth image which is the most published image I think um, um, that exists and I was just downloading different resolutions of it and made it, that into an A2 print as well. So it's, it's, it's really working with these ideas of resolution and, 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 and then scale action, things like that. And it's very within a specific specificity of digital print in a way, but also of image as well, almost at the end. And actually this is the one which I was working on and I've had to abandon it. Um, is uh, it's going to be a handmade book um, with you know, not an internet published book, but a book which uses um, absolutely specific Epson um, output quality, which is the same image and it plays into the resolution. And that's what I'm working on pretty much now. Anyway, it's a bit of a rush through. Mm -hmm. um, that's it.